So my name is Gil Brown. I'm a senior human systems engineer uh, at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab working on the IACD portfolio. Um, today we're going to have a pretty engaging conversation with a rare group of experts on the topic of trust in automation and autonomy, as well as trust in a zero trust environment, uh, uh, followed also by um, trust from a CISO perspective. There's lots of uh, factors that go into each of the various topics I just mentioned. Um, we know that trust plays a significant role in the cyber arena in adoption as well as an organization's willingness to move forward in areas such as automation, autonomy, uh, and more. So with that, um, we wanted to bring a panel together uh, to discuss what the state of the current is and where we need to go in the future. Um, I'll give a brief overview of some definitions, introduce our panelists, I'll have some focus questions for them, and then I'd like you guys to really participate and have open questions at the end. So um, today we have Dr. Jennifer Ackerman from JHUAPL. Uh, she has a perspective of trust uh, from an automation framework, a trust and automation framework that she's developed with her team here uh, for the IACD portfolio. Dr. Ackerman uh, is the trust initiative lead, has conducted various research in factors affecting trust and automation with SOAR. Her team has developed a draft framework to help identify and properly calibrate trust and automation. Next on our panel, we have Juhi Bay from General Dynamics. She will discuss her team's work in trust and autonomy. Juhi is the product manager for trust and autonomy at General Dynamics Mission Systems. Her autonomy team has studied and established pillars of safe and effective use of autonomous platforms. Jeff Han Hancock is next on the end. Uh, he's with the Advanced Cybersecurity Group. He'll provide a perspective on trust from a CISO's perspective. So Jeff brings extensive experience as a cybersecurity SME for over the past 20 plus years across government and industry. He has held many positions, including CISO, CTO, VP of Operations, Engineer, et cetera. He's built 18 security operations centers and has run 12 others, including the Pentagon, and advises CISOs on cyber operations. Uh, last but not least, we have Aubrey Merchant Dest with Symantec. Uh, Aubrey will offer us the latest in trust as it pertains to threat detection, endpoint, and network availability, visibility rather. As Semantic Federal CTO, Aubrey is well established in research and collaboration with next generation security technologies, partners, and thought leaders to identify where the next big advances in cybersecurity will be needed. His current focus is toward cloud and distributed computing services. So a little housekeeping before we begin. Um, to effectively have a conversation, we wanted to define some things. Um, trust, reliance, automation, and autonomy. So trust is the firm belief in a reliability, a truth of someone or something. In this case, we're really talking about something in this conversation, I think, uh, for the majority of this. Reliance, and also a big factor here being dependent on or having the confidence uh, based on some experience that you have. Automation, uh, a system working by itself or with some amount of human intervention. And lastly, autonomy, uh, a system acting in more independently without intervention of a human at any point in time while the system is operating. So with that, I'm going to go uh, have Jennifer uh, give a brief introduction of, of the work that she's doing. Thank you, Gil. Uh, yeah, I'm the lead for the trust initiative here uh, for IACD, and we've been working on a framework trying to put together what trust and automation means and how that all goes together. This is my team, um, Fareed, um, Gil is on my team, uh, Rose and Willie Stewart. Oops. Uh, I think he's already covered that. The only interesting thing is that I've worked in a lot of different domains, and trust goes across all those different domains. There's some standard human issues that come up with automation in any of these different domains. So I most recently I'm working in cybersecurity and learning about that. Uh, so we started off trying um, 
knowing that IACD encourages the use of automation and to meet these pressing needs of cybersecurity. So we would like people to use more automation um, to increase their ability to deal with uh, cyber threats and activities. However, there is some reluctance to using automation, and some of that reluctance is due to a lack of trust, or at least that is what people say. Um, so we started off with the whole question, lots of questions. So trust in automation, what is trust in automation? What do we know about it so far? Um, how might it impact cybersecurity and the IECD efforts that we're working on here? Uh, can we measure it in any way? And what are the gaps and additional work that we'll need to do? And to start addressing all that, um, we started with an academic literature review and looked at lots of different papers about that. Um, we also looked at the previous reports that IACD has put out and some of the efforts we've done and our financial pilot and looked through all the information that we had there. We also uh, had a focus group here with some non-cyber automation designers, developers, and deployers to get their take on how they've had to deal with automation in their environment and what they have learned through that. And they've been doing that for decades, so we figured they'd have some good insights for us. And so through all those activities, we've come up with this, um, whoops, no we haven't. <laughs> Apparently, there we go. <laughs> we've come so up with this. Having two people with the remote. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, trust in automation. Uh, framework that we put together on the left side, we have some perspectives that we have um, saw in the literature that we think are important to take into account. So the first is the automation life cycle. Kind of depends on where you are in the life cycle of your automation as to which aspects of trust you need to be thinking about and worrying about. Um, different roles and personas in the cyber domain. Um, so the CISOs, the security architects, um, the operation managers, and the analysts who are actually using the automation in most cases. Um, then there's lots of sources of mistrust that you can have. Um, so you could be worried about the security of your automation, or you could be worried about the algorithms that are in your automation, and, or the communications between the human and the machines, or machines to machines, information, its operational fit. All those are things that could be a problem, and you might be worried about all of them, or you might be worried about just one or two of them. Um, there's also different types of automation that we've already um, enumerated um, in IACD, uh, the sensing, the sense making, decision making, acting, control and management, and it kind of depends on what your automation is working on as to how trust plays a role. Um, and then last, which we are the least um, defined on so far, is the scope of the automation autonomy. And we've stuck mostly to the automation side. So I'll let Juhi talk about the autonomy side. Um, but so you have no automation, you do single function automation, combined function, then we have our very broad terms of partial autonomy, and we're not really sure what that means, or full autonomy, and what does that really mean in the cyber domain? Um, so that's on the left side, and those are all the different perspectives you could take and the change how you might look at what's on the right side, which is our model of all the different influences and conditions that result in whether you're using the automation that you've invested in or not. Um, so as I said, IACD anticipates that using automation will be a helpful thing. Um, of course, there are levels of that, so if you don't have automation, then you're doing a lot of manual work that you probably didn't have to do. Or if you have limited automation because your people aren't using it as much as you hoped, once again, doing more manual work than you might have to. So you want to, but you could also have excessive contribution, which means that the, you're letting the automation do things that it really shouldn't, in which case you don't have as much manual labor, but also you probably could have some very big fails um, because the automation will get in there and do something that you didn't expect it to do. Um, so you really want to be at the middle level of valuable contribution. Um, and to get to that result, we've defined three different conditions, which I can talk about a little bit more later. Um, but one of the big things that we've noticed was that everybody says trust, but it's really kind of interesting because you're actually, trust is kind of the attitude. Um, and it's really the behavior in many cases that we really care about because it's their behavior that actually Im impacts whether they're going to use the automation or not. Although trust, their attitude obviously affects their behavior. Um, so we've kind of divided those out and we've also noticed that there's lots of influencers out there. And we've put them in categories, but they do interrelate in many ways. So we have a technology category, so these are all the things that can help make your, your automation appear more trustworthy or perhaps too trustworthy to your um, uh, analysts. We also have, the, like I said, the trust area, which is your, their attitude. Um, so there's a lot of human aspects that come in there. The human's perception their, of themselves as well as their environment um, and the automation. And then 
all those feed together and you end up with their behavior that they actually do, um, which once again, you have different levels of that, um, but the environment will also impact that. There are times where people will trust something and maybe not use it for operational reasons or they will not trust it, but they have to use it because they're so overworked that they don't have any options. So there's lots of other aspects that come into it and we can talk about that more later. Thanks very much, Jennifer. So uh, next we'll have Juhi Bay. Um, I'll advance this for you and then I'll let you take over. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Juhi Bay. I'm a product manager for Trust and Autonomy at General Dynamics Mission Systems. If you guys are unfamiliar with General Dynamics, uh, we're a huge defense contractor. We build ships, tanks, uh, submarines, and also uh, luxury jets. If you guys flew in on a Gulfstream today, it's a $65 million uh, Gulfstream 650, then let's talk about what you guys do so that <laughs> I can move into that role. Um, so my role is in making sure that our military can use uh, the future of unmanned, semi-autonomous, and autonomous platforms in a safe and effective way. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, Bill, can you play the video, please? Thank you. So you guys probably saw this on the news last year. This is a uh, video of the Uber incident that happened in Tempe, Arizona. Um, the woman who was crossing the street with her bicycle was uh, hit by the semi-autonomous Uber vehicle uh, while it was in autonomous mode and died. Um, you saw in the video the footage of the, the operator who was assigned to make sure that the vehicle was operating safely. And she had placed an uh, incorrect amount of trust in the system. She had been in that vehicle for hundreds and hundreds of miles. It had never malfunctioned before. And at that instant, it did. But at that instant, she was watching uh, unfortunately, uh, a TV show on her, on her tablet. She was watching The Voice. Um, so she didn't wake up that morning and decide, I'm going to not pay attention to the road and accidentally kill somebody. She developed an incorrect amount of trust over a period of time, and unfortunately, it, it failed her. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. When we talk about trust. Um, I think Dr. Ackerman brought up a really great point. Uh, there's a difference between trust and trustworthiness. So trust is that feeling that you have um, the emotion, the, the sentiment that you have towards other things or other people, right? Um, I hope that you guys don't trust me to the same level you might trust your spouse or your best friends. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is trustworthiness. It's this idea that something is deserving of your trust. So in the Uber incident, you saw a divide between trust and trustworthiness. The trust being the incorrect, the, the incorrect amount of uh, confidence that the, the operator had in the vehicle and trustworthiness, the, the amount of trust that that vehicle deserved at that, at that point in time. And I like to point out that that vehicle, I think there was a lot of, um, talk on the on media about how the, it was impossible to have perceived the pedestrian ahead of time so the accident was inev inevitable, excuse me. Um, the accident was actually preventable. The, the vehicle perceived the woman six seconds ahead of impact and yet made no uh, effort to, to make any uh, mitigating actions. So when we talk about the military space. We're talking about manned and unmanned teaming, having soldiers or the warfighter work alongside uh, these autonomous machines, work inside them, um, be in direct control of them or in, in remote operated conditions. Uh, but we have to make sure that not only are our warfighters protected from autonomous platforms, that innocent civilians are as well. Um, the Pentagon just released, uh, I think yesterday, a report that in 2018 there were 120 civilian deaths um, and 
And I think there are watchdog groups that will argue with that and say the number is five times more than that. And that's just in 2018. And I think we all know that when we cause the deaths of our own warfighters or cause the deaths of innocent civilians, we're not doing ourselves any favors. Um, so when we start using autonomous platforms in these settings, we have to make sure that they're deserving of their trust. And how do you make sure of that? You have that first pillar uh, that we call cybersecurity and sure control. So protecting the system, making sure that it's been trained properly, making sure that it's uh, not being spoofed with faulty uh, position data or bad communications, uh, bad orders or, or uh, spoofed orders. Um, so making sure that it is as locked down as possible and trained as, as, as well as possible. But we all know, uh, we're all reasonable people, we're experts uh, in the cybersecurity field. It is impossible to 100% cybersecure anything. We do the best that we can, but when you're putting a platform out there as an operational uh, technology, it's never gonna be 100% cybersecure and it's never gonna be 100% uh, trained for any and all situations. When we think about uh, today's self-driving cars, we think about, okay, you, you follow the dotted road, you follow the stop sign, you, when a pedestrian walks in front of you, you stop. That's not the case when you're in a, a war zone. You don't have, in many cases, a perfectly working street. You don't, you don't have street lights that work perfectly. The pedestrian that walks in front of you uh, may not be uh, somebody that you don't want to hit. Uh, maybe you want to drive down both sides of the road. So there are a lot of ways that uh, the training can fail and the cybersecurity of your platform can fail. So this is where the idea of trustworthiness comes into play. Can we tell the warfighter how trustworthy their platform is at any one point in time? And then action recommendations. So let's, I don't know how many of you guys are, are veterans. Um, uh, or current active military, but um, I'm, I'm not, I, neither, I'm neither a veteran or, or a active military, but I've been told that when you're in an active war zone, your first thought when something tells you that something is malfunctioning or, or not deserving of your trust or less than trustworthy um, and you're being shot at, you're not gonna sit there and you know, take out a booklet and read through the codes of what's wrong and say, ah, code 06562. Um, I see, I have to go outside and, and restart this uh, one small piece of the platform. That's not gonna happen. You're probably freaking out and your adrenaline is rushing and the idea of uh, having to critically think about um, something that you don't quite understand, is, it's not gonna happen. So this idea of action recommendation, telling the warfighter what it is that they need to do in that situation to maximize mission success is very, very important. Uh, and this rounds out what we call the pillars of safe and effective use of autonomous platforms. Thank you, Juhi. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna have Aubrey uh, give us uh, the state of the current. So good, good morning and thank you for, uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I wanna start off by uh, maybe bringing it back down to earth a little bit, give you guys something to think about. A few years ago, uh, early in the year, it was January, one of my kids got sick. I had to take them to the pediatrician and because it was the beginning of the year, the pediatrician gave me a form that I had to fill out. Basically everything that was needed to steal my identity was on that form, including my driver's license, my social security number, and uh, anything, you know, pretty much everything short of a bank account. So I think about that with respect to what it is that we're trying to solve for in this particular space. And I, I want to give you a thought to hold on to. How would the world be different? How would cybersecurity be different if data never had to transit, right? So let's think about it from that standpoint. You know, there was just, uh, uh, you know, mentioned by, by the director of the NSA about this notion of a, of a, of a, of a guard, cross-domain guard. And if data never had to transit, then we could really focus on who is interacting with that data or what might be interacting with that data, whether that would be a human or a non-person entity, per se, and really start looking at their behaviors to understand what the level of trustworthiness is. And understanding as well, of course, that trust can 
can increase or it can decrease based on behavior, and that can change over time for, for whatever t particular reason. So we think about this, you know, within Symantec as uh, really, you know, the frontier that, that we need to be able to solve for. And when we talk about zero trust, you know, just even thinking back to our symposium that we had a few months back, there was a session that I did, and there was still some questions coming exactly uh, from, from the audience about what exactly is zero trust. I think uh, we need to understand that zero trust really is not just authentication, it's also authorization, and then it certainly goes, around, uh, goes along with role-based access control or attribute-based access control, if you want to think about it at kind of a deeper level. Uh, and all those things really kind of working together to control access to critical data and understand the behaviors of those people or those things that are interacting with that data. So when we think about it from the standpoint of uh, what would that look like from a, from a technology standpoint and how we're sort of you know, building our uh, solutions portfolio to address it, we think about the notion of a secure access cloud or probably better thought about as really a security access broker. So this is not, not the same thing as a cloud access security broker, that's really kind of a different model. But what this capability is acting as effectively is exactly a broker between the application or the data within that application and the users or the devices that are gonna be interacting with those, those applications and that data. And then maybe taking this a step further, I didn't build it out on this slide, but you know, based on modern cloud computing technology, there's certainly services that are running on the back end of the application as well. And we wanna to wanna, to, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we're managing the, the authentication and the authorization of those services, really the identity proofing of all aspects of the sort of end-to-end -end communications of the interaction with the data, even being able to view it and being able to potentially print it or, or save it. So if we look at that as a, a secure access broker, we can start now to imagine to have controls that are sitting uh, in front of the applications, in front of the you know, critical data, whereby instead of trying to solve with a, with a firewall, because it's very difficult to do, firewalls really are working with ports and protocols, we need to be able to peel into you know, the over-the-top HTTP to understand exactly what's happening within the application in many cases, and then you know, being able to provide limited access to that data or that application. So taking that a step further, we also want to be able to, to manage the hygiene of the devices or the, you know, the, 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 that are interacting with those applications as well. And here, what's old is new again. Think about this as network admission control, which is something that's been around for 10, 15 years. So you know, once that user or that device then proves its authentication, they are then allowed to have access to the application and the data that resides in it. What's very interesting about this slide that, that might not be obvious is this notion of the connector uh, that's right, really sitting in front of the application. That connector is only allowing that application to talk via TLS to the security access broker, right? And the device that's, or the user that's accessing that application now is only able to access that, that application via TLS 1.3, whatever, you know, whatever we want to standardize on. What's interesting about this approach, and, and getting back to the, uh, the focus on trust and autonomy, is that because we have now created two discrete TLS connections, we have the ability to look at the interaction of that user and the application on the wire, in the cloud, uh, and, and don't just think about this cloud uh, broker or this security broker as something that's running in AWS or Azure. Think about it as well as something that could be running locally on-prem. So, we get back the visibility, we have more intelligence about the behavior, how the user or how the device is interacting with the data itself, and then we have better intelligence to be able to make better decisions, be able to drive more meaningful automation. So if we take that uh, you know, to, to its next step, uh, you know, talking about that at, at you know, being able to get context and certainly what's happening at the application layer, we are approaching it really in this respect from a security access cloud you know, being able to, you know, control access to the, you know, to the World Wide Web, right? So these are traditional proxies. We could certainly imagine to add some data loss prevention or some automated classification as far as what is that user downloading from the internet? What are they uploading to the internet? Being able to control access, or I should say access to the internet as well as what they're posting on the internet. 
utilizing cloud access security brokers. Obviously, that gives us some visibility and control into what's happening within the SaaS applications. And then the secure access cloud or secure access broker that I just talked about a moment ago, which is going to give you that visibility and control and context into what's happening in a private published applications. And then, of course, being able to extend that capability into the legacy environment so that you have a complete holistic picture. Most importantly, being able to manage this with a single policy. So you don't have one policy for the internet, one policy for SaaS, another policy for IaaS, but really being able to pull it all together, being able to integrate all the, the log information, all the, uh, you know, the detailed access information and context that we could pull across the entire domain, or all three of these different domains, and then being able to merge that into something that's more meaningful for you to understand what are your users doing with the, the network, or how are IoT devices uh, interacting with the network or with other devices as well. So I'll uh, stop there and hand it off. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, let's see. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Went okay, too that's far. me. You're fine. Everybody knows go. what I look like. Jeff? Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I think uh, I'm going to take a step back for a second. Um, you know, why are we talking about cyber automation to begin with, right? Automation in a variety of fields has been around for a long time, in particular for cyber operations. Quietly, uh, and I mean quietly, I don't mean uh, industry specific, but I mean in pockets uh, with organizations I work with and people I work with. Automation's been this thing that's rumbling in the back of your mind. What should I implement? What should I automate? What should I do? How should I do this? Is there a framework to use? Is there not? And years ago there was not. Um, looking at your organization as, and my conversation, my comments here are going to be more focused on the operational practical level of this challenge. What elements should be automated within an organization? Uh, to manage your security operations. And a lot, of people, uh, a lot of people think that when you hear security automation, uh, you think, well, we need to automate because we don't have that many workers in our space and we need, you know, we need to reduce the workload, et cetera, et cetera. And that's true to a degree. However, uh, when you talk to CISOs, CIOs, CTOs, operators, um, it's really less about I need more staff and I don't have more staff so I want to automate these functions. It's about there's so much noise operationally uh, I'm afraid I'm chasing my tail. I'm afraid that I'm looking in areas that the adversary is just watching me and from a different part of the room. Uh, how do I automate this noise, cut it down, and using essentially you know, the 80-20 principle, the Pareto principle many, many years ago, 100 years ago, uh, but applying that to cyber operations. So looking at what you do, uh, looking at what a CISO does, looking at what your engineering team does from an from operational perspective, identifying what's most important, most valuable, and then automating the 80-20 as a starting point, right? What two things can I automate to cut down the noise? What two things, whether it's a product, whether it's a methodology, um, regardless, what do I need to do today? And then how can I expand that so that I can actually try in some capacity get ahead of the bad guy, get ahead of uh, vulnerabilities in my network, zero days, et cetera, et cetera, and try to figure out how to secure my organization. So, you know, the question that, that we talked about, me answering here first today, um, across the industry, across the, the CISOs that I work with, um, you know, when you talk about cyber automation, it is very much the, yeah, it's great, it's pie in the sky, you know, how can I just automate, you know, whitelisting what I'm doing? How can I automate identity access management? Because this is very tactical for me. Uh, in the last couple of years, that's finally starting to grow. People are saying, okay, I get these components of my cyber operations. And I know I can automate this and this. What else can I automate? What else can I do strategically to automate? So in cyber operations, you can look at it in three, three buckets. Tactical, operational, strategic, right? No surprise there. Tactical layer, it's very much the hands-on technical, hands-on keyboard, monitoring, watching the network, watching the bad guys, et cetera. The operational level is where CISOs predominantly sit. So it's managing the spinning plates. It's the program management of uh, cloud and identity access management and audits and all of these administrative functions in security are over the technical realms of security. And then the final one is the strategy, right? What am, how is what I'm doing protecting my organization, impacting my organization, in, whether it's an agency or a company, where, where's the value proposition? Uh, where is the risk, enterprise risk strategy, and how do I play into that as a CISO? Uh, so when you look at a, an organization across those three levels and you look at what you can automate, uh, you know, on one hand, the sky's the limit. On the other hand, you, you know, back to the question we talked about earlier, um, it is looking at your organization through the 80-20, saying, what can I get done today that I can automate that's fast and easy, that gives me just a little bit of extra cycle time, saves me just a little bit of energy. Uh, and what we found over the last 
year and a half working with the IACD group is that there are some ways and methods to go about doing that that expedite um, from a CISO's perspective, again, what they can automate, what they should look at, how they should look at their organizations. Um, so cyber automation, I mean, you know, we were talking, I was talking to a friend the other day about, about this and, and one of the, the uh, definitions that have seemed to be resonating, and I wanna write this down to make sure I get it right, because uh, we've used this quite a bit. Um, cyber automation definition, the use of automated systems to detect, prevent cyber threats while contributing to the overall threat intelligence and of an organization in order to plan, defend, and against all future attacks. And that's a good roundabout definition of cyber automation from a, an operator's perspective, right? How does it work for me? Why should I care? And that's always been, that statement has always been a uh, foundational conversation holder for us when we talk to folks about how to implement this stuff, so. Thank you all for uh, establishing a bit of a level setting for us. Um, I'm going to go into some more uh, pointed questions with the panel. Um, the first one is for Jennifer. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about what you learned um, and what you know about trust and automation, what your team has kind of discovered? Could you show our framework? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is what we, we've been working on, as I said earlier, and we've come up with trust and automation is really a very multidimensional um, very interrelated, interdependent problem space. Um, there's been a lot of research in it from the human factor point of view for about three decades now. Um, most of that research, unfortunately, has been done in laboratories. Um, so it's very small scale compared to what we're thinking about here. Um, also, you'll notice that we have a lot of different influencers in there. And it tends to be that most of the papers pick one or two, maybe three. And if a really good paper, it has four or five of them. Um, and it tries to look at how they're interrelated and how they affect trust or reliance. And we also noticed in the um, literature, there's an interesting equivalence, but not equivalence, of trust and reliance. Um, a lot of times, because you can't really measure trust in a really good way because it's something that's internal to the person. Um, so you can ask them questions, uh, see what they say, um, but it's hard to know exactly how much they trust something other than what they tell you. Um, so a lot of times they resort to their reliance. Um, and in some cases, particularly in a laboratory experiment, that may be a really good equivalent. Um, reliant, if they're relying on it, then they probably do trust it. Um, however, I believe probably in the operational world, it's probably much more nuanced and once you look at your environment that's also going into it, then that's another thing that affects it. And so we felt that it was really important to pull apart the, the trust and reliance in our framework and look at those a little bit separately. Um, and then a lot of the research has also focused on how the technology is actually designed and how it interacts with the human. So there's a, a lot of work there. Um, and there we decided that it was good to call that trustworthiness. So that's a property of the system that they need to look at and pay attention to. Um, it involves a lot of different aspects. Um, a lot of times the one most used in uh, uh, research is reliability, so it's accuracy, it's availability, um, that type of thing. Um, but there's a lot of other aspects that come into it. Um, and I would probably claim that one of, one of the most important ones is transparency, because that allows the users to really understand what the automation is doing and not only what it's doing, but when it actually should be used and when they should allow it to do something for them. Um, so I think that's one, one of the more important ones. Um, but they all interrelate with each other in various ways and our ultimate result that we'd like to get is some um, good automation contribution um, so that we can get all those wonderful things that we talk about here at ISCD all the time, um, speed of scale, your operational consistency, risk reduction, and uh, also allowing the analyst to not work on as much of the, the tedious work and do some of the higher level work. Um, so I think we've been putting all those things together. Um, trust in automation is a big multi problem that we've been trying to put together and figure out how it all fits, but I think pulling it apart in different ways will allow us to look at it um, more carefully and also figure out ways that we can measure it and actually um, influence that um, over the time. Great, thank you. Juhi, can you tell us how trust and autonomy differs from trust and automation? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Bill, if you could play that first video right here. 
I like videos. I'm part of the YouTube generation, so this is how I communicate. Um, this is a Pop-Tart making machine. Um, I know it looks rather grotesque, blown up that big. Um, I hope you guys ate breakfast. <laughs> And uh, you see here, it's doing the same thing over and over and over again. There's nothing that it has to make a, a complex decision on. It just does the same thing over and over again. It probably has some uh, low-level sensors that dictate you know, where it cuts the flaps and how often it uh, squirts the blood slash strawberry <laughs> paste. Um, but if you go to the second video, Bill, so this is a, a video that came out earlier this year, a Russian company called Yandex. Um, so this was a, a big deal when they released this video. Um, if you notice where uh, Uber and, and Tesla are doing their test driving today in the US, they do it in places like Arizona, where the streets are wide, where there's no snow, where there's a little rain, um, where there's not a lot of pedestrians. Um, but if you saw in that video, it's a snow-covered street. It's weirdly narrow at times. There are pedestrians that are in the road when they, when they shouldn't be. Um, and it safely manages to navigate all those situations. Um, so when that video came out, that was a big deal. So that is an example of autonomy, um, or at least semi-autonomy, where it's making all these complex decisions on its own and judging for itself what the best course of action is. So when we talk about security and automation versus security and autonomy, um, I think we have a lot of um, confusion when it comes to the industry when we talk about automation versus autonomy. Um, and my team does differentiate auto automation versus autonomy for this reason. Automation being that it, it doesn't make complex decisions, autonomy being, meaning that it does make complex decisions. So when you're trusting it to make complex decisions in high stakes environments, like in a self-driving car situation or in uh, a warfighter scenario, uh, that is when you really need that uh, dynamic understanding of how trustworthy that platform is at any one point in time. Thanks. So, Aubrey, um, how does one achieve an appropriate level of trust in a zero-trust architecture environment? I think that has everything to do with classification. And sadly, you know, that's something that, that we have a hard time agreeing on, right? I think, I think we could all agree that social security numbers are something that's, that needs to be protected, right? But you think about all the different sources of data across the government that are supporting even at the state and local level, there's no real consistent way to, you know, to perform that, that, that data classification. So the classification of that data, of course, relates directly to the risk. And the level of, of zero trust that would need to be applied to make that effective is really going to depend on what your risk tolerance is or what the importance is of that data. So I think to be able to effectively truly implement a, a zero trust model with varying levels of, uh, of, of let's say, access and, and authorization, we're going to need to have a more consistent methodology on how we classify data and what it relates to. Great. Thanks. Um, Jeff, uh, if you can speak to what effects we're seeing in industry today regarding uh, trust and automation and autonomy, what are you seeing out there in, in the wild with CISOs? Sure. So, you know, the understanding again, on one side, the CISOs, the organizations, the operators can get very over, have been getting very overwhelmed with the amount of things you could automate. Really, right? There's too much stuff out there. So, being able to again, as I said earlier, being able to break that down, neck that down a little bit. Um, to understand what is most important, um, what to implement, what not to implement. On the, I think actually your next question, if I'm, that's important as well, you know, automated provisioning, right? So real quick, being able to tie those things together, uh, understanding what the top 10 things you need to manage are, what do you need to provision, how you need to provision, whether the dependencies are a product, a person, a business operations piece is an critically important. Obviously you can't, you don't want to automate something. Um, automatically that, that impacts your business negatively. So there always has to be that tight connection between business and business rules and cyber operations security. So being able to look at what an organization is doing uh, and understanding 
again, taking the 80-20 principle uh, and understanding how that, what, prioritizing the list of things to do, and then as far as being able to automatic, automatically provision the lowest common denominator of set of tasks, set of rules initially, and then slowly growing that and building that trust as was talked about just a minute ago. Um, that takes some time and trust the technology, the operations, the business plan. Um, there'll never be, I think, uh, a fully autonomous system for cyber operations. You're always going to have somebody there uh, just because the business alone changes uh, pretty regularly, let alone how you're attacked. So, Great. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer, um, since I work on your team, I kind of know I don't have to ask you the first question, which is um, are there challenges with measuring trust? Yes. <laughs> what, what are the challenges with measuring trust, if you can elaborate on that? Well, I've already mentioned one of them, which is that um, trust, the, the, the part of our um, framework that we're calling trust, is, is an internal um, belief or attitude that a person has. So there's no good way to, um, or objective way, I guess. I shouldn't say good way. Those aren't necessarily the difference. Um, subjective way. You have to do subjective ways to, to evaluate that. Um, and then reliance is something that you can look at, but that doesn't really get you too far. It's like they use it or they don't use it. You need to look more deeply into you know, why they are or why they are not using it. So it's, it's very hard to do, and they're all interrelated. So I think probably in the, fu in the near future, we probably need to start coming at it from a lot of the different influencers and trying to measure each of those and figure out how they can be put together in a way that we can actually measure some, something that we will evaluate and call trust. Great. Just a pulse check. Are you guys dying with questions out there? Uh, raise your hands. I want to kind of gauge how many questions we might have. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'll move on. I'll leave you guys plenty of time. Um, Juhi, can you talk about any industry standards um, being devised to identify levels of assurance or trustworthiness um, that we need to know with autonomous systems? Um, so I, I can't speak for the commercial industry. I can't speak for the cruise automations and the Lyfts and the Waymos and Teslas and Ubers of the world. Um, I'm sure there are some, I, 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 uh, excuse me. I should say I know there are standards that are being made uh, under IEEE and SAE for the cybersecurity of autonomous platforms. Um, but the idea of trust is, uh, and standardizing how we define uh, and measure either trust or trustworthiness, um, I believe there's been very, very little official work out there. Um, there's a, a, a DOD, cross DOD community of interest called the Autonomy Community of Interest. Um, and I know they've been doing a, a great deal of work over the last few years talking about um, independent verification and validation. Um, how do you make sure that when you, uh, you know, put together a platform uh, and test it through its initial procurement stage, uh, its procurement stages, and then when it actually performs in the field five years later, that they perform equally as effectively. Um, there's, I know there's a lot of work going on there, but the simple answer is, to my knowledge, in the military space, no, there are no industry standards that are being made um, for trust or trustworthiness in autonomous platforms. Okay. Open question is, um, uh, are there factors to consider in automated provisioning? I kind of spoke to that. Yeah, yeah. It's probably uh, your question, Jeff. Appropriate place to remove humans from the loop. The next question. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we kind of get the idea that tier one analyst tasks are heavily automatable, right? Um, but I guess the, the question is, um, are there important things to consider in factoring when, you're, when your organization is setting up uh, provisioning in an automated fashion? All right. So certainly um, this plus the next question actually, um, one, you don't want to remove the human from the loop ever um, because cyber IT systems are mechanics, right? They're mechanical elements. You always want somebody in that, that loop. So being able to understand, again, what you want to automate in your organization um, you know, you could basic, you could automate certainly the tier one, all of the tier one elements. You could uh, automate a lot of the tier two elements, but why would you want to do all of them? Certainly there's a return on investment in doing some of them, but as I said earlier, um, it's a speed thing, right? You, you want to be able to, to manage the amount of data coming in, manage the, the 
repeatable tasks where you know what the outcome is going to be within 80%, let's say, uh, which is usually a rule of thumb for, for socks that I've worked in before. Uh, and then you automate the rest, and, and you always have that 20% of the individual looking and watching and paying attention to. Um, it does free up the individual uh, to be able to do more work. Um, but again, you know, you, when you want to automate something within a, a SOC or within any cyber operations, um, you've got to make sure that the 10, 20, 30, 40 percent of the tasks you're willing to automate, tracking those, identifying the impact of those to the rest of the organization inside cyber and IT, and then how the impact of that is on the outside to the business group or the agency. Great. Open question, and this will be my last one before I open it up uh, for you guys, is what industries do you feel are leading in autonomy and what lessons learned can we take from this? I think that's definitely you. <laughs> so that was secretly a Juhi question, not an all question. Sorry. There's got to be a curveball somewhere in there. Um, I would say absolutely. Um, the the reason why in my entire uh, speaking session here for this panel has centered around self-driving cars is because uh, self-driving cars not only have the, the huge um, uh, media impact that they do, but they also are getting a huge amount of resources poured into them. Um, they are, in my opinion, absolutely leading the industry. And uh, if you talk to um, the uh, DOD um, teams that lead these acquisition efforts that are going on now, like uh, the unmanned, uh, uh, medium-sized unmanned surface vehicle, the Navy's um, most recent announcement that they were going to drop an RFP, it was supposed to be a few weeks ago, um, it still hasn't dropped yet, um, for this uh, future medium-sized unmanned sur surface vehicle, uh, the Army's next generation combat vehicle, family of vehicles, um, you'll see that they all draw lessons from the autonomous car industry, uh, commercial car industry. But you'll also see that the autonomous commercial car industry, they take lessons from the commercial aviation uh, industry. So it's a, and the commercial aviation industry takes lessons from the military aviation and then it becomes a whole circle. But yeah, that's my simple answer, the commercial self-driving car industry. <laughs> All right, yes sir. You with a question. Um, what about the internet and uh, the functioning of the internet? Is it not an autonomous system, just not under anybody's control? It's been that way for many years. I think at that point you start getting into the definition of autonomy itself. Uh, I think uh, when my team first started, we were trying to define for ourselves what was trust, what was autonomy, what's automation. And a question that came up was, are humans even truly autonomous? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, that, that's a really great point. I, I think when we start talking about what is truly autonomy and what is truly industry leading in autonomy, uh, I don't know if the internet is an industry in and of itself, but um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's a great food for thought. I, I would say that I don't really think about the internet necessarily as being autonomous. I think about it more as being resilient, right? Which is why it was created in the first place. It's the threats that, you know, the ease of threats propagating across the internet that are really kind of driving uh, the, uh, the uh, automation efforts that we're, we're speaking to within this environment. So. Great. Uh, we, ha we had some folks that wanted to ask questions. So you can head up to the mic. So uh, quick question, how do you guys uh, message trust and risk together? So, uh, you know, I, I've seen it uh, messaged both ways and kind of people confuse the two. So I've heard business operations and, uh, and risk. Aubrey, you mentioned risk a couple times. So I'm just curious how you would not only message your board uh, when, when the two are, are brought up, but not only that, uh, I've heard privacy and trust mixed as well. So I just 
you know, how do you how do you message folks when those those elements are brought up? And that kind of goes back to your framework. Where is risk in in your framework, and how would you address that? So, so I think about uh, you know risk management purely in terms of NIST and the 800 series. I mean, I've, I've just been uh, I'm 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 deep into it, right? So I think about it from a, a risk management framework standpoint, and really being able to categorize and classify your mission uh, to be able to understand where most where, where that risk exists, and and kind of getting back to the comment I made earlier about uh, a lack of consistency in classification of risk, uh, let's say, not, not classification of risk, because I think that's pretty well defined, as far as how an agency uh, defines their risk is really left to their specific mission. And it would be better, I believe, or, or you know, objectively, if we could come up with some sort of standard way to address uh, how agencies are, are classifying their risk, regardless of their mission, because at the end of the day, it depends on you know, the data that could potentially be exposed, uh, whether that's PII, whether that's intellectual property, whether it's, you know, what have you. So, so real quick to tie into that, um, from both my experience in the private sector and the public sector, being able to tie uh, from an executive's perspective, what do we exist for? What's our most important set of processes or procedures in the organization? Every company, every agency has a risk process. Outside of 853, they have a, what do we do? Right? What's State Department actually do? What, what's important to Walmart, right? And when you, my experience, when you look at those, you have experience with those different types of groups, you see suddenly over the years a lot of similarities in how they approach enterprise risk. Again, not cyber, but enterprise risk. Being able to add to your question, how does trust and risk management come into play? When you start talking about uh, the conversation of cyber operations and securing your most important jewels and, and your most important processes, not necessarily IP, but your processes, um, being able to identify that from a business side and saying, okay, as we drill that down, how do we take care of it? How do we protect it? Who has access to it? How is it used across the organization? Those, there's five sets of, five questions that get asked in that process. And you go back to the, you, to the IT slash cyber team and say, okay, how do we protect it? How do we make sure it's, it's updated? How do we care and feeding of that data? And you're actually able to neck down and define for this organization, even, even within business divisions or agency divisions, being able to say, for this corporation, there's five areas of risk management, and here's the trust cyber, oper uh, cyber automation component of that. We can automate these five things uh, at this level, but we have to have this type of oversight. Uh, from the private sector side, it's, you know, it's, it's, we have th these two business divisions. Here's their operations. Here's the risk to the company if things go sideways from a, a cyber risk management perspective, and then saying, okay, we've got the compliance side, We've got operations. How do we then make sure those two things come together? As they intersect, that's the, the trusted conversation. Who has access? What are we automating? How does it, and, and actually, there's a set of documents that you can create that says, here's trusted cyber operations, or trusted IT cyber operations and automation for our company. Here's exactly where they impact the customer. Here's how where they impact the, the senior executives. Here's where they impact the supply chain. And actually having a mapping of that. Organizations, I mean, it's a bit of a headache, quite, quite frankly, to get through sometimes, uh, but the value is there because people are like, wow, okay, now I can actually tie these things together and I get a better holistic enterprise risk management view. Um, but organizations, when you get to that level of detail, organizations are like, okay, there's getting to be a lot of data. How do I ingest this? is great information, but what is this, how are we going to do this information? What, what's a good, the value proposition? So it's a really good question. Um, but there's definitely, there's roadmaps there. There's, there's ways of getting that done. So, yeah. Great. Um, Janet? Yes. Um, so the Uber car ex um, accident, that, that was a good example that trust builds over time. And our adversaries with the information warfare, um, so it's not just the cyber component, there's also the psychological influence that kind of influences our, um, diff the public's beliefs and what they trust, and that builds over time. And so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and how that might impact because um, the trust in, in automation, it goes to whether the public trusts, that, you know, whether the government is um, spying on us through our tech and our, you know, in, in our homes, or you know, the, the automated um, election systems, if there's trust or reliance in those. So be interested if what type of role are, like our, so it's not just um, inherent trust, but also manufactured trust or our adversaries influence like if that's even measurable or your thoughts on just what kind of impact it might have in trust and automation. 
Sure. So just to um, kind of, the, so so we haven't really been focusing a ton on the human, even though the trust framework considers it. We've been looking at this from a trust in the technology side perspective. But I'll right. let you so, guys see if you want to. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. I was talking this. about trust in technology, but but the adversary's influence over whether we trust our technology, sure. as opposed to in our own inherent trust, just from our own experiences and conditions, I guess. Yeah, because like topic, trust in like election systems, that's I guess there's some amount of autonomy, <clears throat> or the um, or a Lexus or whatever in our homes, whether people trust if the government's really using it to spy on us, you know that sort of trust, not just trust in the. So I guess the the thing I, I might offer, I don't, I don't know that this is going to help, but I mean recognize that that there's a lot of attribution that's available, right, on on you know from from our, the connected world that we live in. And as a nation, we could choose to, you know, have more intelligence about what's happening at, at every level. You know, the challenge then becomes what, what's done with that data, right? And is there, you know, proper oversight of who's interacting with that data, who has access to it, and what they might be utilizing it for otherwise? You know, you think about, you know, the world we live in today with data brokers, frankly, you know, I think about the reality that, you know, between my phone company and my internet service provider, I'm not sure there's much else to know about me, right? I just have to trust that they, that they are going to be good custodians of the data that they're collecting about me. But I don't know, while, while I will say that we could imagine that if we were to do this at a national level, we can get better attribution, dare I say, about uh, where bad actors are are manifesting themselves and how they are trying to, you know, carry out psy psyops. I guess we would say, right? But uh, that's a potentially a slippery slope, right? Do you want? Uh, do we want to collect that that much data about everyone that's uh, in the country? And then how do we how do we properly provide oversight in a trustworthy way to make sure it's not being abused or uh, used for you know, unintended purposes. Okay, so thanks. Let me add on to that, and, and your question, uh, by the way, is something that I think almost everybody in the trust and autonomy space uh, grapples with, and not successfully. <laughs> um, so when uh, my team first formed, um, one of the first problems that we were actually thinking about solving was uh, what we all know as a fake news problem. Um, we were thinking and talking about um, at the, at, after the 2016 elections, um, there was a huge outcry of Russian or foreign influence uh, in the uh, spread of information or misinformation. Um, and there was a really great uh, report that the Atlantic Council released that uh, is called, I think, the MADCOM future, the machine-driven communication future. And they talk about how uh, artificial intelligence has gotten so good that you can actually now create videos and pictures that are entirely fake. Um, but you can't really tell the difference anymore. Um, so there's a... I'm referencing a video again. I unfortunately don't have it with me. But uh, <laughs> there's a video on YouTube that is uh, Obama giving a speech, for, uh, our former President Obama giving a speech that he actually never gave um, because a computer, an AI, managed to create that speech and you can't tell the difference between a, a real Obama speech and that fake gen uh, generated one. And when we start talking about um, trust in the media, trust in our politicians, trust in um, the, our democratic institutions, um, it is, I think, a, a very hard question between constitutional rights, um, as uh, the NSA deputy director was just referencing earlier this morning, it's a very hard question that they have to learn how to differentiate between constitutional rights and how do you protect the information that people get in today's society. Okay, I want to tackle one last question, and sir, I see you behind. I invite you to come down after. <laughs> so, Tony, um, 
20-second shot clock, but uh, we'll see if we can address your question. Okay. Um, a theme that has, I have detected at previous events of this sort is with regard to cyber automation, businesses and organizations are very happy to have automation to get to recommendations, but they seem to be very reluctant to take that last step of letting automation of response actions happen. And if we're going to gain the benefit of speed and responding in cyber-relevant time, we need to be able to do that. So how do we apply the things you folks have learned in your work to move the broader community toward actually allowing automated response actions? Well, <clears throat> so I'll take this real quick. Um, yeah, it's a matter of maturity, right? I mean, no one, you're, you're actually, someone talked to me about this a few months back, and the, the challenge was, do I trust the technology enough to do this? No. Why? Because I'm a human, and I'm independent, and doggone it, I want control. Okay, I got that, but at some point, you can't control everything, because you're inundated with so much, in this case, it was intelligence, cyber intelligence data. Um, I think it's a maturity, in my experience, it's been a maturity model, helping those organizations understand what can actually trust. You know, it's like people who, you know, dating my daughter, which will never happen. Um, you know, you have to develop that trust model uh, of who you're talking to, and what you're saying, what they're saying, do I need to carry a gun, all those types of things. So when you're in cyber operations and in business, you have to understand how much am I leeway I'm going to give this technology and what's the, what do I get back from it. And it, it's, I, I found, in my experience anyway, it's, it's a very stair-stepped approach um, to develop that, the human, because humans aren't naturally trusting in cybersecurity in particular, um, and it's a risky business. So it's, I've, I've seen it work, but it's taken time. Great. I never imagined we'd end this with dating daughters uh, conversations yeah, analogies, but <laughs> this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you all, and uh, thank you very much for listening.